Thank you, Jai, and the worship team. As always, they do such a good job. Let's give the worship team another round of applause, yeah? I don't know about you guys, but it's always a pleasure to worship here. I know that with the craziness of uh, the coronavirus and um, all the toilet paper and water being bought out, right? Um, if you guys do run out, just come to church. We have plenty of toilet paper here. Okay, You can't take any, but you can use some, all right? But just as Jai had mentioned there in the last song, I just want to take a minute here for us to pray for our sister Grace and our brother, uh, Pastor Tufu. They, they're church planting in Charlotte, but as we know this week, uh, it, they, um, last week they lost their daughter. Um, and so uh, they, uh, their family, uh, it's not an easy thing. And so uh, if you guys could just close your eyes with me, we're just going to take a minute here to pray for their family. Holy Spirit, I pray that wherever uh, Grace and Tufu are now, and they're along with the family members that are here, that are not here, Father, that those that are out and about, those that are attending their own church, Father, all around the U.S., uh, Lord, it, but we are a body of Christ, and we are also a family in that, Father. So when one hurts, all of us hurt. And so, Lord, we take this moment, and we just want to lift Grace and Tufu to you, that you are their protector, you are their Lord, you are their Savior. But most of all, you are their comforter. There's nothing that we could do or say, Lord, uh, that would ever uplift their hearts. But, Father, it's in the moments of loss, in the moments of grief, that, Father, um, they will turn and they will look to you and they will see your face and you will shine upon them. And so I pray over their family now, and for the daughter um, that they've lost, but now is in your kingdom, God. And we thank you that you are still good through blessings and through loss. And so we pray and we lift uh, our sister and our brother to you this morning. Before we begin our service, Lord, we just pray that you would just open our minds and our hearts to what it is that you have in store for us this afternoon. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. You guys hear me? Okay, great. All right. Um, so, so just some interesting facts about the human body, all right? Um, did you guys know that uh, when you blush, right, that's actually a your adrenaline, your blood kicking in, and your face turns red. Anyone have Asian blush in here? Like, can you turn red for me? I right, look up, right? Some of y'all are turning red right now, right? Maybe you got to look across the room at that cute boy, all right? Or maybe you got to look a, a, across uh, behind you at that beautiful girl, right? Because if you look in front, all you're going to see is their hair, right? And so you got to look behind. Um, but that's, that's what it is. Blushing is caused by an adrenaline in your body. The blood flows, right? And here's another interesting fact. The heartbeat, all right? Everybody feel your heart, wherever it is, all right? Your heart beats, on average, three billion times in your lifespan, in our lifespan. That's how many times it would beat, right? Three billion times. I think about that, and I'm like, I think mine stopped a few times when I looked at my wife, right? So I don't know if the number's correct there. Here's another interesting fact, right? In general, it takes 24, 24 to 72 hours for food to move through your digestive system, right? So, but the exact time, it depends on the amount of type of food that you have eaten. And so sometimes, you know, you eat beans and you start getting gas, right? You eat meat and you start feeling lean, but you start eating fatty foods and you are what you eat. Right? Another interesting fact this morning is about the brain. Research has shown that on this curve of forgetting, right, forgetting stuff that we learn, within one hour after you guys leave here, you have, forgot, you have forgotten 50% of the information you have heard. And within 24 hours, on average, 70% of what you have heard today you will have forgotten. And then by next week, next Sunday, when I ask you guys, you can be like, I think he talked about something about information, right? Because by next week, you would have forgotten 90% of what I've talked about today. So I can just say whatever I want. You guys won't remember anyways, right? The human mind, it, it tends to remember bad and good events the same way, right? In similar ways in our lives. Think about it this way. Think about the arguments that you have. And then think about the celebrations that you have. When I think about arguments, I'm like, I, I, without a doubt, I ask couples, I'm like, what did you guys argue about? They think about it. They can tell me all the details, but at the end of it, they'll be like, Man, it was so pointless, so dumb. I don't know why you argue about it, and they can laugh about it, right? 
And at the same time, they could say, hey, it was so important. He needed to wash the dishes. Sifu, you've got to make my husband wash the dishes. That's what we argued about, right? And then on the other side, the flip side, the human mind remembers celebrations. If I ask you about your last birthday, you can tell me the exact food that was made. You can tell me the candle, the smoke. You can tell me the smells. You can tell me the faces, the people, the aunts, the uncles, the grandmas, grandpas who gave you money. You can tell me the gifts that you got, right? The brain, it does this weird thing where it remembers events, good and bad. We remember much because it means much to us, right? There's so much in our lives that we store it away in our brains and we have this long-term memory. An interesting fact, very much like our body where it has all these things where we blush, where we eat, where we think, very much like the body of Christ, we receive things in the same way right here in the church, right here outside of these walls, in and outside of these walls. We do the same. Here's an interesting fact. From A.W. Tozer, a minister, uh, a brilliant mind of the 21st, 20th century, and he says this, If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church, the church body today, 95% of what we do will go on and no one would know the difference. Right? But if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, I mean the one in the Bible, when they first started the church, 90% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference would know the difference. You know, we're so quick to rush to the stores, right? As I said earlier, too. In a heartbeat, we would rush to the stores to buy toilet paper, water, food for our families because of the coronavirus. But no one's in a rush to come to church. The church will always be there. I can just stream it online. I don't want to get sick, right? But how many of us truly rushed here this morning and said, I want to come and worship God. I want to come and fellowship with my brothers and my sisters. Listen here. The Bible describes us as the body of Christ. The Bible describes what we do. The Bible describes itself, the Word of God, as spiritual food, as water, as milk, as bread, as the meat. Right? It's, it describes itself as spiritual life. It's everything you and I need to live out our lives. It's the substance that you and I need. I believe that our church, we're, we're founded on this passage. Um, and I believe that we have to live this out. I don't have it up here, but it's founded. This is one of the passages that we're founded on. It's on Matthew chapter 28. And in that chapter, Jesus describes and he commands he says, this is what you ought to do. This is the ways you're, because I've been given an authority, because I've died and I've rose again, and all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go. Teach those who you're going to disciple. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Right, now go. Go and make likewise. Go and develop. Go and train. Go and send out. Go and make disciples. I believe that that's one of the pillars of our church. And that is what we're talking about today. How we obtain this, how we live out this life as true life folks or folks who believe in Jesus. And it starts with this. A pretty harsh letter that Paul writes. Paul writes this to the Corinth church. Right away he says this. The church and its leaders. He says, Brothers and sisters, I cannot address you as people who live by the Spirit, but people, but as people who live by who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I'm going to pause for a second. For years and years, I never understood what it meant to live by the Spirit. Right? Living worldly, yeah, I still understand that. We're in the world. But living by the Spirit, I never understood it. In the simplest terms, it's not living out of order, but it's living in a way where you can't understand it and that you have to rely on God. In my own explanation, that's the only way I can explain living by the Spirit. It's not living out of order, but it's living in a way where you can't understand anything in your life, but you have to rely on God. Verse 2, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. There's that word again. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, you are, not, are you not worldly? There's that word again. Are you not acting like mere humans 
For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, you are not mere human beings? Verse 5, what after all is Apollos, and what after all is Paul? Only servants, through whom a, who came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but, but God has been making it grow. So neither one who plants nor neither one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. We are co-workers in God's service, or co-laborers, as other versions would say. You are God's field and God's building. That's the word of God. Now catch this, right? Three times Jesus says this word, worldly, worldly, still worldly, right? Still worldly, still worldly, and we are living worldly. What does it mean to live worldly? There's still fights. There's still jealousy among us. And I'm going to put it in a biblical, in a leadership, in, in a church context. And this is what it is. And this is what we are in, in the body of Christ. When we say things like, I'm making disciples for Christ. Or I'm living my life out the best that I can for Christ. And then we try to top each other or we try to do better than one another. There's, there's, a, there's something great about the spirit of competition, but... When there's fights and quarrels around, um, among us, there's arguments and there's talk, then we are living worldly. We're still living worldly. A good friend of mine, Dr. Rob Reamer, says in his uh, most current book, he says this. He says, I hope that I live to see the day when Christians stop fighting and attacking each other, other Christians, and live unity in unity and charity on mission for the king. Because when we're battling in the trenches to set the captives of hell free from sin, bondage and despair, it hardly, seems, it hardly seems appropriate to turn our weapons upon our fellow soldiers on the same mission for the same king. Right, that comes out of his book, Deep Faith. That's how we're still living worldly. Did you know that in your, in your home, right, right now, your home, whether you live your your mom, your dad, or it's just you and your wife, or you and your husband, when you're fighting, it, it's okay. I'm not saying that you can't have arguments. I'm not saying you can't have fights. But when, you're, when we have quarrelsomes and we're having this thing where you and I, we're, we're on the same team, but when we turn on one another, we're still living very worldly. And that's what was happening in the first century church in Corinth here. And this is why they've come to this argument. And real quickly, they're following human beings. And who is it, right, as we go back here? They're following guys like Paul. Paul is writing this line. And they say, one says, I follow Paul. And this says, I follow Apollo. So a disciple of Paul, right? And even later on, some would say they would follow, follow, be following Timothy's teachings. But what we do is we follow human beings. And this is what the disciples did, right? And this is what we do. I listen to this preacher. Well, I listen to this preacher. I listen to that preacher. Well, I know this guy. I know that guy, right? And don't get me wrong. It's okay to look at people and to, to, to say, that is person is a man or a woman of God. But when we idolize them, that, they become our gods. They're not. God isn't our God anymore, but these people in whom we listen to. I have a good friend here. He lives in New York, and he, he, always go, he, he always goes, when he's free, he goes to listen to this one preacher. I'm not going to say his name in New York City. And he listens to him. He's like, he's pretty much the closest thing to God there is. And I was like, if God is a bald white man, then he pretty is close to God, right? But I said to him, and I said, brother, I don't think that God is a bald white man. I think God looks very different. I don't know what he looks like, but I think he is a holy God. And this is what's happening in the church as they're following people, they're following their ancestors of what they said about God and what they know about God. But here comes this passage here. Um, and this is, this is a time where Jesus comes up uh, to his disciples and he, he asks them because what's going on is he knows that what's happening is that people are coming and they're asking Jesus to pre perform miracles. They're asking Jesus to do these things. They're asking Jesus all these things because they want to catch him doing these acts, but they want to catch him. They really want him to prove himself to them. But after all the people go away, Jesus pulls the, the disciples to the side and he says this. 
when he came to them in Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say I, say the Son of Man is? And he is the Son of Man, right? Jesus is. And the disciples re- replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. To this day, I have Jewish friends who, who still claim that Jesus was just a good prophet. He was just in an incarnation, reincarnation of John the Baptist, of Elijah, of Jeremiah. These are people of the Old Testament, right? That's who they say that Jesus is. Let me ask you guys, who do you say Jesus is? Verse 15, it goes further. Well, what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Look at this as I underline this. This is what they replied. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. The disciples only knew to follow men. They didn't know any better. They only knew the Torah, which was the Old Testament. They only knew that Moses wrote this book and that their forefathers were these men that they had to follow. These are the things in which other people were, take, were teaching them, and they knew no better. But for some reason, as Jesus stated, Peter was revealed and who Jesus was, and he confessed it. And going even further, who are these men? Who are these men that we follow? Who are these men that as descri- Paul is describing back here in 1 Corinthians? Chapter 3. Just mere human beings, right? Just servants. And when I think about servants, I think about it this way. Think about us. We're just servant, servant leaders. That's what pastors are. We're, we're no better. And I think of it this way. How many of the men in here like to fix things? Raise your hands. How many of the guys don't like to fix things? That's me, right? <laughs> I only fix things because I have to. Right? I, go, I go over to Brother Vamo's house or I go over to Brother Sing Sai's house and I'm like, dude, come to my house. I'll pay you to fix something, right? Or I'll call them and teach me how to fix this. When I think of it, right, when I think about fixing stuff, or men who like to fix cars, or maybe there's women in here who like to fix things. When I think of it, never once do you go up to a tool and you start using it, and then, and then when you're done using it, you hang it up and, the, and then you glorify the tool, right? And you're like, that's a great axe. What a great hammer, right? That's a beautiful Phillips screwdriver, right? No. And never does the, the tools talk back to you, right? Maybe they might like hurt you, right? They cut your finger off, like si and si vinyava, right? Messing with the wrong tools, right? But never once does the tool talk back, or never once does the tool say, I am the master, or I want the glory for what you are building. Right? And that's what uh, Paul and what Jesus is saying here in this passage here is that these are mere men. Paul stating, verse 6 here, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. He's the one to make it grow. What I love, uh, in another version, it says it like this. In the message, Paul says, I planted the seed, it's Apollos watered the plant, but God made you, you grow. It's not the one who plants, nor the one who waters, who is at the center of this process, but it's God alone who makes things grow. Planting and watering are minimal servant jobs at minimum wages. What makes them worth doing is that God is the one we are serving. So you happen to be God's field in which we are working in. It's the church, the body of Christ. Furthermore, it says this. I love this passage because it's convicted me over and over, and I pray that it'll convict you today 
In John chapter 5, starting verse 39, it says, You study the scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory for, from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. It kind of hurts, right? When, because this is Jesus talking. He says, but I have come in my Father's name and you have not accepted me. But if someone else comes in my name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And Jesus said this way more many years after Paul has already planted the church. And once again, these troubles are stirring up again. Once again, it's okay to follow preachers. It's okay to listen to your, your favorite preacher on podcasts or whatever it is you do. But he's saying here, why? Why do we study the scriptures in search of eternal life? When Jesus himself, he's the very scriptures. He's the eternal life that you and I to be looking for. And that's the thing that Paul talks about in the beginning, living in the Spirit. Being able not to understand all of this, but being completely reliant on God's Word, but completely reliant on what His Spirit is doing. And when Jesus was saying this, He was saying this to a Jew generation, very similar to the Hmong people. The Hmong people, we wander around, we're called the the, the, the word Hmong is translated as free people. But if you talk to Hmong people, Hmong people always have this orphan spirit that we have no home, we have no country. The ass is where we're from. We're not from Mongolia, we're not from China, we're not from Thailand, we're not from Laos. But the word Hmong, it's, there's so much pride in it because we are the free people. But as Jesus was talking to the Jews, the Jews had been wandering for years. And as they come to the promised land, they get to this point where they're waiting for this Old Testament figure to show up. This Messiah, this promised king, this guy who's supposed to come and overthrow everything, the politicians and all. But when Jesus came, he came in a humble way. He was born in a manger as we know the story. He didn't come in a glorified uh, armor suit, but he came wrapped in a robe with sandals. Of an uncut beard and long hair, as it's described throughout time. I don't think he was the six foot blue eyed Jesus we see all the time. He may have been good looking, I don't know. But when Jesus comes to us in modern day, as he did in the Old Testament, he came very gentle. And most of the time, not all the time, he wasn't flashy. And he didn't come the way that you and I wanted him to come. He comes to us, and he comes to us in our hurt and our loss. He comes to us in our 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 confusion and our anger. He comes to us in times when we don't want him the most. You ever get mad at your spouse, or you get mad at your children, or get mad at your mom and dad, and in that moment you just feel a tug like, you need to go talk to him. Or in that moment, you could probably be like, I didn't do nothing wrong. They better come apologize to me, right? But then the Holy Spirit's tugging at you, saying, this is the time you're supposed to come to me. Come to me, and I will lead you to them. Those are the ways when Jesus comes to us. When he's saying these things, these are probably the things, I would guess, that are going through the, the Hebrew people, their minds. That they're searching for God in the Scriptures, as we do, as we encourage you guys to. Read your Bibles, pray, do that. But those things, did not. Jesus is not in them, but they lead you to him. Rick Warren, he says it like this, and I shared this two weeks ago. He says, we don't read the Bible for knowledge, but we read the Bible for transformation. And I would add this in my own version. I said, we don't read the Bible to know doctrine or theology, to know this. We don't just for the study of God or the ideas about God, but we read it. So that we can live it out. That's why we read the Bible. We don't read it for head knowledge. We don't need, even read it for heart knowledge. We read it so that you and I can live it out. This is what Paul was saying when he said we ought to live by the Spirit. Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians in verse 10, continuing on in this passage, he says, 
But the grace God given me, I laid down a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that already is laid, which is that of Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, or wood, or hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring in to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Pretty scary. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer the loss, but yet it will be saved, even though only as if one escaping through the flames. And some say the flames of hell, the flames of fire, of eternal fire. And what Paul is saying here through the Holy Spirit is, we can't fake it, guys. We can't say we're doing things for God, but really we're not doing things for God behind doors. We can't say we're living this Christian life, but we're not really living it. Because it would be tested. Because we can offer God gold, silver, costly stones, wood or hay or straw, right? We can offer Him these things, these things in our lives, and we can make it look good to everyone around us. If we build on these things, but through refiner's fire, it will be revealed in time. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be crawling into heaven knowing that I've done my best. Not crawling to heaven because I've been burnt and burnt hard. Let me ask us this question. And I said this last week and I said it, I'm saying it again. I want to ask you guys this before I ask it to myself. Are you trying to be somebody? Or are you trying to love somebody? Are you trying to be somebody or are you trying to love somebody? Because this is what our church is built on when Jesus said in Matthew 28, go. Go and love on others. Go and make disciples of the Go, go, make, bring them in. Train them forward, send them out, right? A professor of mine once said, looked me right in the eye after I got done preaching. The class clapped, but he looked me in the eye. He said, Steve, you can't glorify God and yourself at the same time. And it hurt because I was trying to make much of myself and not make much of God. But I want to heed a warning to you guys is that if you make much of yourself, you're not giving any of the glory to God. You can't do both at the same time. So let us give glory to God fully all the time. Amen? Here's an example of this. Some folks, they studied the Bible well, but, right? But when, they, when we asked them, right? I asked this question. I say, are you actually making disciples for Jesus Christ? That's the question I ask. Are you actually making disciples for Jesus Christ? This is the follow-up question. I mean, answer. They say, they'll play it off. Shrug it off, or they'll, they'll explain the heck out of their, their question. They'll say things like this. Well, we have been faithful with the sheep in our pen, meaning our church, or those that are coming to our church. Uh, we got to make sure that they're fed well, too. So we, we got to know our stuff so we feed them. Like, we got to know the Bible so we feed them. We got to have quality disciples so they pick and choose who they let into their church. The Bible says, never does it say, do we pick and choose those that come to Jesus. For Jesus calls people and they come to him. I've never read in the Bible where that it says you should pick and choose those who come into your church. And then as I ask this question, are you actually making disciples for Jesus? They follow up with more answers like this. And they say things like, we have to know the word of God so deep. We have to study theology. We have to hold certain stances and views. We have to hold certain doctrines and certain points of theology before we can go and make disciples. I understand. We've got to know who we are before we go and spread it, Jesus. But if we always only live at that point, we will never make it beyond the command. It wasn't a suggestion, but it was a command in Matthew chapter 28. At the end of Jesus, before Jesus ascended to be with the Father, this is some of the last words that he says to you and I. 
And so after all that explanation, after I ask people this question, are you making disciples for Jesus? And they give me a whole bucket list of why they're not making disciples. They didn't say anything about making disciples, but they gave me a bucket list of why without saying I, we don't, right? I still answer, I, I still follow up with the question, are you making disciples for Jesus? This is what it is. Discipleship is not a study of God's word only, but it's a formation of one's whole being in order that you may love, equip, and send others to do the same. That's what discipleship is. It's not just a study of God's word, but it's a formation of one's whole being in order that you and I, we can love, we can equip, and we can send others to do the same. It starts from here here we have to make that connection it's spiritual formation it's not an informational knowledge thing but it's a spiritual formation one theologian says it this way he says hoarding of the good news that jesus christ the son of god the messiah who became one of us so that we can be more like him who died on the cross so that you and i can have eternal life hoarding that news to yourself is wrong it's dead wrong and what he's saying is if you know something so good, if you got the secret keys to life and your friend next to you, your brother, your sister, your neighbor, your community does not have it and you have it and you hold it. It's like during the coronavirus, if I had the, if I had the answer, if I had the cure to it and I held it to me and myself, and I didn't even share it with my wife or my kids or my family, that would be wrong. This is what the preacher is saying. For us to hold the gospel. Because we are ashamed of what people would think of us if we share it with them. If we're, we're afraid if they reject us or they reject the message. So we end up not doing anything at all. Right? Another person I said, are you making disciples for Jesus? This person said, well, the loss will always be there. My jaw dropped. I said, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, go, go and reach the lost sheep. Jesus said, the poor we will all, always have among us, but never did he say the lost will always be amongst us. Jesus doesn't want anyone, not anyone to perish. Paul says here, continuously in Corinthians, he says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for for what it is. Because the day will br uh, bring it to light and it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what is being built survives, the builder will receive a reward. The builder will receive a reward. Let me, let me tell you this. Right? Youth, young adults, if your mom and your dad's in here, I want you to turn around and look at them. Right? Just look at them. All right? If your husband or your wife is in here, I want you to turn and look at them. All right? And then mom and dads, I want you to look at your children. All right? Get this. Your children's faith will not save you. And, and youth and young adults, your parents' faith will not save you. Husband and wives, your wife, your husband, and then look at the pastors here. See if you have us in the back, see if James up up here and myself. We cannot save you. We can do nothing to save you. We can encourage you. We can build you up. We can train you. But only Jesus can save you. They cannot speak on your behalf. On, behind your, on your behalf. I cannot speak on, on your behalf. When you pass on to glory, you will present yourself before the Lord. And this is the quality in which we'll be tested. You and I would have to answer to a holy God who is righteous, who is set apart. And he would ask us how we were faithful with what was given to us. I don't know about you guys, but I tremble with fear in my salvation that is freely given. And I want to live it out fully because I don't want to present myself before God and say, yeah, um, what you gave me, I was kind of scared to share. So uh, I just kept it to myself and uh, I buried it. Or, um, yeah, I don't want people to think weird of me. So I hid it away. I don't just want to be a survivor of it, but I want to be one of his tools. I want to be one of his servants. This is the last question I want to ask you guys. 
And I believe that this is Jesus. And he's, he's counting, he's, he's saying this to his disciples way even before he, he carries the cross. But I'm, I want to ask you guys this today because it's really relevant. And he says, are you willing to carry your cross starting today and on a daily basis? Because this is, that will be the refining of the fire. These are the things in which will be tested. Are you willing to carry your cross? Because Christ knew that mankind, we're lovers of the self, right? That's why Christ told us to deny ourselves, and then we're to carry the cross. Because guess what? As we looked around to our family members, to those that are closest to us, to, to our pastors, I wish when Sifu Nyeva passes away, I could just, he could just take me with him. I wish when my wife, or if I die, I could just take my kids and my wife with me. But no, individually, you and I will have to answer and only to, to a holy God, and only Jesus will be there to intercede for you and I. But he's asking you today, you carry, and would you carry your cross? And I said it like this, right? As I asked myself this question, I scratch my head and I say, Lord, I, I will carry my cross so long as it's not too heavy, it fits into my schedule, and it does not burden my family or my friends. I will carry my cross and I will share the, the gospel faithfully but I'm not really sure how to live it out, Lord. You know what, Lord? I love you, but man, people annoy me. As a matter of fact, I would die for you. I just, I just don't know how to live, how to be a living sacrifice for you. Does that sound okay, Lord? Does that sound okay to you guys? That if I carry my cross, that it has to fit into my schedule, it has to fit in, to, there has to be no burdens, right? That I could share but people annoy me. Right? Some of you guys like get off the stage. <laughs> one one guy says it like this. Not one guy, but an author, a uh, survivor. And he, he really knows what discipleship is. It's Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He says it like this. He says, if any man will come after me, and he's quoting that of Christ, let him deny himself, right? And then carry his cross. The disciple must say to himself the same words Peter said to Christ when he denied him. I talked about this last week when Peter denied Christ or two weeks ago. I know that not this man, right? I know not this man, meaning I don't know. Peter denied Christ, but when he, Christ is telling us to deny ourselves, we have to say to ourselves, I know not this man. But self-denial is never just a serious, isolated act of mortification or asceticism. It is not suicide, for it is not the element of self-will or even in that. To deny oneself is to be aware of only that of Christ and no more of self, the self. To see only Him who goes before and no more roads, which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is, He leads the way, keep close to Him. That's what it means to live by the Spirit, as I was saying also in the beginning. That's what Paul calls us out in. A good friend to my wife and I, and uh, a professor of mine for a long time, uh, this Pastor Mike Plunkett of Risen King Alliance in New York says, this is part of the carrying the cross. He says, life in the spirit cannot begin until you decide life in the flesh will not work. Plain and simple. Life in the spirit cannot begin until life and the flesh will not work for you and I. I encourage you guys this morning. You feel the Holy Spirit tugging at you. You feel the Holy Spirit like, am I really living out my life? Am I really making disciples? Am I, do I really understand what I'm doing here? I want to encourage you with this. Because we've got to read more into Scripture. The rest of Scripture says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, right? So that no one can boast. So not anything you and I could do. But he calls us to do, to live out. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to good, do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Which God prepared for in advance for us to do. So when I go back and I ask this question, are you making disciples for Christ? I'm not trying to say that I'm better. I'm not trying to say that you're better. I'm not trying to say that you and I have to, have to do these things. But it is by the grace that has been given to you and I. 
we should extend that grace as well. But we are God's handiwork, created in Christ. And another version says we are his co-laborers. We are his co-workers. We are his children. We are his people. We are his family. And this is the work that he had already prepared ahead of time. The good works in which Jesus did and then Jesus commanded us to do. And he says, when you go, in John chapter 14, you will go and do even greater things if you do it in my name. I'm going to ask you this morning. Because we're all going to have to go through it. Some of you may be going through refiner's fire right now. And some of you may be relaxing in it. You're still covering whatever it is with gold, with hay, with straw, with silver. But if you're ready to go through the refiner's fire this morning, and you're, you're tired of settling, you're tired of just hiding the gospel away, I want to challenge you this morning. You're tired of living this double standard life of lad of two-face, good and bad and bad and good. I want to challenge you this morning to live beyond that, that you can I want, to, I want you guys to stand with me. I'm going to read this one more time. Because guess what? By next week, 90% of what I say won't even matter, right? 95%. 90%. But if the Holy Spirit were withdrawn from our church today, 90% of what we do will go on. And no one would know the difference. But if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did was stop. I want us to be a New Testament church. That 95% of what we do would stop because we're not spirit-driven. And as I'm reminded, our church is very spirit-driven by the Holy Spirit, by that of Jesus Christ, the Son, and that of the Heavenly Father, God. And so I want to challenge you this morning just to close your eyes. And if you want to live in this New Testament church, that you can't move without God moving, that you won't do without God doing. I want to challenge you this morning. Leave your old ways. I want to challenge you to deny yourself and say, I don't know this man, I don't know this woman, but I want to rely completely on you, God. I want to move when you move. You guys just to close your eyes. I want you to pray with me. I want you... I have you standing for a reason because when you stand, you're serious. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are standing in this room right now. That they're tired of trying to do for you. They're, trying to, they're tired of trying to read enough, to know enough. They're, try, they're tired of sin managing, Lord. They're, but Lord, this morning they want to take up their cross, which is going to be hard on a daily basis, but they're going to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow you. There's the key word, Lord, to follow you. Be completely reliant on you this afternoon. And if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. As you do in class, just raise your hand to the Lord. Just say, I'm tired. God. I don't want to sit on the sidelines no more. And I know, Lord, that you have commanded me, but I know it's a commandment out of love. And that is how you're teaching me to love. And so, Lord, with my hand raised high this afternoon, I will not live the same life I did coming in this morning. I vow to you this morning, Lord, that I will live through refiner's fire. I will not cover up with straw, with hay, with silver, with gold, for I know that your testing is coming, Lord. And I will not be afraid of that, but I will live a victorious life. I will be a servant leader for you, Jesus. No matter the cost, no matter what it looks like. I will live by the Spirit, no matter what it looks like, because I, I don't know what the future holds, but you do, Lord. And so I give my life to you this morning as a servant. Use me as one of your tools to glorify your work, your body, your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. We pray. These things in your name, the name above all name. Amen. In the words of the great Apostle Paul, go and, go, uh, uh, go and do likewise. I pray and I bless that you guys will have a good afternoon and, and good rest of the week. Try to remember 90% of this sermon. <laughs>